Hi, my name is Brian Powers and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project. And today we are in Cincinnati, Ohio. We are, it's um, June 8th, 2014, and we're in the home of Herschel York, who's a World War II veteran. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna be talking a little about um, his experience, what he did during World War II. So Mr. York, I wanna thank you very much for doing this interview. Well, thank you for having an interest in World War II. I can't talk to World War II at my dining room table without losing everybody at the table. No one wants to hear it. Because unfortunately or fortunately, I wasn't a hero. But I enjoyed the three or four years when I was in my 20s. Well, you did uh, some interesting things, I think, when you were in the service, and we're going to talk to that. But before we get into your time in the military, we want to get a little bit of background. So we always start out asking you, where were you born? And I was born in Buffalo, New York, Memorial Hospital, on April 14, 1922. And um, your parents, what did they do for a living? My father was a scrap iron dealer. He'd come as an immigrant, as a peddler, and built up into a good business that supported our family, sent us the kids to college. Hard-working guy, did nice you, guy. Did your mom work or did was she stay at she home? She never worked. She um, got as far as ninth grade when her mother had twins, and it was her job then to come home and help her mother. She always missed not going any farther in school. So was she like older of a big family? Did she have a lot of younger brothers um, and sisters? She had an older brother and uh, then younger younger sisters. But she was the oldest daughter and responsible to her mother and father who were immigrants who really didn't know how to exist in, in the United States. So she was born in, in the U.S.? No, she was born in Europe. Okay. And her next sister was born in, in Europe. Well, how did, how did your parents meet? Did they they meet lived in, in the United States, I guess? Yeah. Uh, my father came here at 21, and there was a lady that he knew that her, was the same village that he came from in Russia, in the Ukraine. That was, uh, he was from a town called Stavish. And uh, his father, his father-in-law, was from Zachka. Anyhow, as he came to the United States, he, he knew that his friend, he, this girl that he knew back in Russia, had married this boy, and they were living in Buffalo. So she was running a boarding house, and she put him in, in the boarding house, and he met you know, some of his buddies from Europe there. Oh, so how did, how did your mother meet him? Then? Oh, what, what, what happened was, he seemed like a, n a nice young guy. They wanted to marry him off. So he, they had any number of cousins and relatives, and, and that did work out. So he was living in there for about two or three years when this little girl, who now was about 17 or 18, suddenly came in the picture, and that's who he married. Mm -hmm. The youngest uh, child, youngest daughter of the family. And uh, were you, uh, w did you have siblings? Yeah, but we're skipping a generation. Okay. I had an older sister who is now 98, 96 years old, and a kid one, kid sister that isn't even 90 yet. She'll be 90 in August. Wow. Uh, no, in fact, my sister was interviewed by Mayo Brothers. They were looking for a gene. I wanted to know why our family lived so long. I don't know whether they liked them or you know, liked the family or wanted to find out why they <laughs> hung around. But when they got finished with her interview, then she signed them on me and then my kid sister. This was a couple of years ago. We're still doing were they, pretty well. Were they taking tissue samples? <laughs> 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 I don't know. Are they swabbing your yeah. uh, cheek? No, I think they did. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that was for something else. Yeah. Um, did your parents, did they live that to, into their 90s? Or uh, my father lived uh, to 80, 89. My mother lived to 92. And my mother's younger brother 
just died last year. He was 11 years older than I was. He died at 101. <laughs> you know, when you have the world by the ass, you don't have to worry. <laughs> you just live long. <laughs> so, okay, so your, your father, he comes to America. Did he even know any English when he came here? No, no. He had been to a, a, a Jewish type of school. Like he knew the Talmud. In fact, he could read Hebrew, which is something that most of your young rabbis can't do. He could read, read Hebrew and be able to understand it. And I get. Did your mom know any? No, no, so no. Did, when they when they first met, they they could they even communicate? Oh yeah, yeah. Like like if Tarzan could communicate with Jane, I'm sure that they could communicate t together too. No, no. Pass the butter. Or right. <laughs> no, that can happen. Uh, okay, so you have you have a few siblings, but where were you? Were you the oldest? The young? You were the youngest. I was in, in the middle. You're in the middle. Okay. Uh, the only boy. So where did you uh, where did you go to school? I went to PS twenty two school in Buffalo, New York, which happened to be next door to next door to, to our house. Oh. As a result, uh, we knew the principal used to park her car in my father's garage when he went to work. And one day, I might have been about three, maybe three and a half, and the principal walked by and said, little boy, would you like to go to school? And I did. I, I made the mistake of saying, yes. So now I'm in school at three and a half. And you know, you're not a leader at three and a half. You're a follower. I ended up following the wrong, wrong people all through PS 22 all the way through Bennett High School, always in trouble, and I was a good, good person, but I just had the wrong teachers. Where was the high school? Was that in walking distance too? You know, it was only a block and a half away, Bennett High School. So, uh, when Pearl Harbor got attacked, uh, do you mm. remember that day, what you were doing? Oh, I sure do. Uh, I had gone to the University of Buffalo, and my folks had promised if oh, I wait did, a minute, you were, how old were you when Pearl Harbor got attacked? 17. You, so, had you already graduated high school? Yeah. What, how old were you when you graduated 17. high school? 17. Okay. So, you were already at, in college. You, were you yeah, in the first spent, semester? I had spent two years in college. Let's see, this. Pearl Harbor was 41. Yeah. I was summer. born in 22. So, I'm 19 years old now. So you were in college already for two yep. years. Okay, so you were in Illinois. I, but before we get into Pearl Harbor then, before that, you tell me that story, I think you started at the University of Buffalo? Right. So talk, talk about how you made the switch. Uh, of those, or why, What were you going to study? Did you know what you wanted to study after you got out of high Commerce. school? What you wanted to do? Come, I didn't know. Well, I was a kid. I didn't know. It would have been nice to be a brain surgeon. A lot of money in brain <laughs> surgery. But... Uh, my father was a businessman. I thought he wanted me to be a metallurgist, but I wasn't too good at sciences. In fact, I wasn't too, too good at anything he, at that time. He didn't want you to get into the scrap business, the scrap metal? Yeah, he, he didn't want me to. He, he figured that I, sh I should do something better. But, so, uh, so you started the University of Buffalo. Were uh -huh. you just taking general classes? or something? Uh, Commerce. Knew how to do a balance sheet and things like that. So, In fact, okay. the, f the first year, Tom Watson came to school from IBM, up, up the road, I think it was in Rochester, and to lecture a, a freshman class. He was just starting off too, and we were too. But that was the education we got. He was looking for people to join IBM? No. <laughs> and you were like, what? what I, yeah, what is what's that? What's the future yeah. of that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's no future in there. That's right. <laughs> so um, so why, why the University of Illinois? Is there a story why you? Yeah. My folks had promised me that if I did well, they could go to college. Because going to a college at University of Buffalo was like being in high school. So they promised. So I applied to Penn State, and I was accepted. My friends knew that I was leaving town to go away to college at Penn State. They decided to have a party for me and a party for a kid that I knew who was going to Illinois. 
And you know, you talk about love, the love that a mother might have for a child or a father can have for a, for a her daughter. It's the greatest love in the world is the love that one drunk will have for the, another. And as we're leaving the party, this kid says, Herschel, why don't you come to Illinois with me? And I never really thought of it. I just wanted to get away from Buffalo. He said, come to Illinois. And that's, that's what happened. So we get to Illinois, and he's got a place to live. There was a new dormitory that had opened, and he went right there. And then I, I said to myself, I wonder where I'm going to sleep tonight. And he, he said, well, let's go up and down the campus, and let's see if we can find a place for you. So we finally come to this big building, said Newman Hall. We walk in, do you have any rooms? Oh, yeah. Turned out it was run by the Newman Association, big Catholic association, and uh, I have a nice room there. But I wasn't too happy, there was no life. It was like living in a hotel. And there was a dining room downstairs. It was right on campus. I was having coffee one morning. This guy comes in, he was in advanced ROTC. He looked like General Eisenhower, really good. And he said, uh, would you mind if I sat down there? I was so impressed, I said, no. So we're talking and talking, and finally I said, he has to go to class. He said, I'm, I have to go to class. I said, I said well, what's your name? He said, my name is Bill Goldstein. I said, are you Jewish? He said, yeah, why? So I'm Jewish. He said, well, what are you doing at Newman Hall? So I couldn't find a place to live. Newman Hall is a big Catholic organization. So why don't you come to my fraternity house and maybe you, you'll enjoy the boys. So that next weekend, I go to the fraternity house and I join. Now as I join, he said, do you have any other friends? I said, yeah, I've got this friend that lives down in the dormitory. He said, let's invite him next week. So we invite him next week. And as we go after upstairs, after uh, eating brunch, he's starting to convince him to become a Tau Epsilon Phi, a TEP. But he's not listening. He's standing right near the radio. He said, oh, are you in, interested in, in, to live in our fraternity? He said, no, don't you hear what's going on the radio? So what? what's going on? The Japanese just attacked Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor, where is that? I said, I think it's in New Jersey. <laughs> but it turned out that uh, he ended up uh, enlisting and in, in, uh, being a bombardier on a B-24. And I ran into him in Kansas City years later as he was getting ready to go overseas. He ended up as a prisoner of war, and that would be an interesting story to interview, interview him. Yeah. Is he still around? He's still around. He's living in uh, uh, just outside of Palm Beach. In Florida. Oh, okay. In fact, I'll show you the articles. That it was very interesting. Yeah. Um, so, Pearl, Pearl Harbor happens. Uh, did you did you just decide you're going to sign up at that point? Or oh yeah, yeah. Because the next day, you know, with when Roosevelt talking about the war and so forth, the draft now was changed from 21 down to 18. And we had to do something immediately. And, and you're so, 19 at this at this point. Yeah. So I joined the reserves. So what did you did you just go in town there and near the university? Was there something? Uh, set from up? the university, there was a bus that would take you down to Chanute Field, which is at Rantoul, Illinois, where I signed up. And uh, I noticed that they were checking people's eyes with and without glasses. And I knew that I couldn't see the big E without, uh, and I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to get in the reserve. So I, I watched them giving the test. I could see the number that down near the bottom that they were asking about. So I memorized the number. And this number, <laughs> as soon as uh, my term came up, I, I rattled all those numbers. They said, you're in. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what would have happened to me if I didn't pass it. That probably would have been drafted. 
So with the reserves, what, what happens then? What, what are you doing? Well, the, the reserves, reserve? they said that they wouldn't call us until after we graduated. And by this time, this was the beginning of my senior year. But no sooner did we uh, get into the reserves, the war wasn't going too well. And they were bringing, calling the reserves in. They called the sophomores in and the juniors, and they, were, they saved the freshmen because they were so young, and the seniors who were about to graduate. But we were the last ones to be called. But I was called seven weeks into my senior year. But I had enough time in my senior year, if, if the professors liked us, to uh, graduate. So the day I was leaving school, I had to take a 10-minute quiz because he had nothing to mark on passing uh, against or for. So I had to take this little exam, and it was either pass it or fail it. And if I failed it, I wouldn't be in the reserves. Then I, 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 I would have been sent. I, I wouldn't have gotten finished with the reserve, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I, I ended up being sent to Scottfield, Illinois. And, and when was that? That was what that year, was a, what month, do you think? It, this was March. This was February of 40, 43. Okay. Yeah, I was supposed to graduate in June of 43. I got there just halfway through the uh, senior year. And... Uh, well, was I, what was I going to tell you? Well, you mentioned Scott Field. Oh, yeah. Scott Field took us a month to get our uniform. So they didn't know how to treat us. More like guests rather than soldiers. Oh, so you arrived yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was just, just outside St. Louis, right? Yeah, that's right. And uh, we were treated as guests. They couldn't give us any detail or anything. So we were very demanding until the uniforms came. <laughs> there was a complete shift. In attitude. And where were they putting you up at? In the barracks. Yeah. But no, uh, no uniforms. But when they came, then we were really in this. Uh, so they got in, even with us. Uh, details all of the all, uh, postal police, kitchen police. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of stuff were they making you do once you got those uniforms? Everything. Work in the kitchen. Uh, but again, learning how to live with the with the life that has been thrown to you, you get the gar garbage detail. No, what's that? You get dirty, but they leave you alone. Well, how much? Uh, uh, how long did or how much of a challenge was it? Was it to the, to adapt to military uh, culture? <laughs> Impossible. There's nothing more sof sophisticated than a college senior, mm -hmm. and now as a dog face. There was a hell of a lot of things to to, to learn to live with, and you, you you learn to live. So, doing you're doing kitchen detail. Were you getting trained to do something? Uh, no. You're just, no. <laughs> no. In fact, the PFC was in charge of the detail that would send us to the KPs. I didn't know what to call them. He was a private first class. <laughs> I'm a <little laughs> private. I'm <laughs> <laughs> you learn to respect the others. So how long were you there doing that? Um, until we got the uniforms, probably towards the middle of April. We immediately shipped, about after a week we got the uniform, shipped to Keesler Field, Mississippi for basic training. Everybody else was being sent in the Air, Army Air Corps to basic training in Miami Beach. They were all in the hotels. It was a beautiful basic training but, to but march not, up and down. But not you. Well, we, we were leaving St. Louis, and somehow we passed through Cincinnati. I didn't know anything about Cincinnati at the time, being from Buffalo and University of Illinois. But I think we ended up and the Southern Railroad, so run by Cincinnati. So they probably tried to run as many of their tracks, the 
Cincinnati tracks, the southern tracks. And we came by way, we went east from St. Louis, east straight on the other, on this side of the Mississippi, passed through Memphis, and it sounded like we we're heading for uh, Florida, going straight to Florida. And we ended up in Florida, right at the border of uh, yeah. Alabama and in Florida, when all of a sudden the train turned right. <laughs> we're not going, we're not going to Florida, we're not going to Miami Beach. <laughs> and we ended up in Mississippi, Keysville Field, which was hell. Marched in sand, seven, six days a week, and all details of rest. Never got out of the base. Never saw Mississippi. I understand it was beautiful. And I, and I guess um, it was starting to get pretty hot uh, that time of year. No, no, it wasn't. There, there was a lot of uh, disease. I forget what, what it was. But uh, it, it wasn't. A, this was May and June. It wasn't hot in Mississippi no, no, yet? No, not no. yet. But it wasn't enjoyable. I guess then, you were getting eaten up yeah. maybe by insects? It could have been. Something, <laughs> something was eating us. <laughs> but then we were finished with basic training, and now we're going north. And I'm being sent to become an, um, a weatherman. And where do I end up? At Rantoul, Illinois, 10 miles away from where I just graduated from college. Just one of those crazy coincidences. My girlfriend, who later became my wife, had just left school about two or three days before we got there. So did you meet her then? Did no, you meet her when you were in school? I met school? her as a junior. Okay. Yeah. And um, so did, when did you know you were going to be in the, the weatherman's squadron? Did you? Not until we got to Chinook Field. I didn't even know I was going to be in the, in the Army. Air Corps until we got there. You thought maybe you were just going to be in the Army? Yeah, yeah. Because the Army was the Army. Right. The Air Corps was part of the Army, just like the Signal Corps. It had been part of the Signal Corps in, in the Army. So did you get tested or something? I mean, did you know how you came about think, to be assigned? I think I probably did well on the test, the test down in Mississippi. But there was a lot of kids that had just been through high school ended up as weathermen too. But probably, even though they weren't educated, probably did pretty well in the test. So I'm not really familiar with, with the squadron. Can you talk a little bit about what, what, yeah. what the squadron did and, and well, what, how, to, how it worked and how big it was? Weather observers are not meteorologists. They report on the weather. They're taught how to, taught how to take a temperature, how to do a uh, I can't even remember now. The clouds. There were three different types of clouds: low, medium, high. Uh, uh, um, stratus is a middle cloud. Cumulus is a low cloud, and altus cirrus is a high cloud. And it's amazing what they were able to, to teach us in six weeks: how to fix a barometer, how to fix equipment and so forth. They did one heck of a job in those schools. But I was going to tell you something. Oh, so the, there are, there is not too much need for weather observers, but they need them to fill every shift. So you need at least four or five. But the squadron itself is made up of a couple of hundred where they are sent to other airfields all over the country. And there's any number of squadrons in the world. We were first the 23rd squadron, 23rd weather squadron. Then they decided it was too big. It was from the, uh, uh, from the Gulf all the way up to Canada. So then they cut it in half between the uh, Mississippi and the mountains. So then they cut it in half and we were north. So we became 23rd Weather Squadron, then shipped to an airfield. Turned out that weather observers don't have too much rank. They're first, uh, uh, first private, first class, then corporals, and then sergeants. And when it comes to detail, 
there was always the people that were flying, like sergeants, could be buck sergeants, staff sergeants, tech sergeants, master sergeants, and they have no duties. They're just waiting to go someplace. So the, the, they would look for people to work as KPs. And all these flag sergeants had enough rank to keep from going into a kitchen for kitchen duty. So where do they look for the people in the kitchen? The privates or the corporals or the little sergeants because they have no, no rank. All of a sudden, there was no one to run the control tower. There was no one to run the weather station because they were all doing KP. Hap Arnold, the commanding general, came into a, a field one time and there was no one running the weather station because they were all doing KP. He said, these people are too important to give to detail that anyone that's on detached service from another outfit does not is immune to pulling detail. As a result, now we have no longer detail. We could come into the kitchen in the middle of the night and say, we just got off of duty, feed us. And the things changed. It was just a great place to be on detached service. I couldn't wish that on anybody else. <laughs> but if you want to make sure you're on detached service, they can't touch you. Well, who oversaw the squadron? Who did you report to? Did anybody? Did you have a, a certain commander? No, or anybody, or? depends on who had been a corporal logger, who had did, um, seniority. I ended up as a sergeant in charge of a group in the, uh, the in the South Caicos. It was a bad island. and uh, But I was in charge because I had been a sergeant maybe a month longer than the other sergeants. <laughs> but I was in charge. So what were your shifts like? I mean, did you rotate? Oh, it depends. If you had four, you would uh, have a, an extra person. You could work for uh, eight hours on, 24 off. Or if there was only three, eight hours on and 16 off. And if you had, had five people, you might even have a day off. So, I mean, what were you guys observing the weather 24 hours a day? Yeah. Uh, I mean, did, but did you have certain shifts that you favored? Like, did you work like working mornings more than evenings? Oh, I or? like night shifts. Yeah. Everyone, uh, there was no officers. They were all someplace to play or sleeping. Uh, but the night shift was great. And so where were you at? Were you in an office setting uh, with equipment or? Yeah, you... yeah, it was off. Well, I ended up in an office because when 23rd weather, when 3rd weather was broken up to 23rd weather, the commanding officer was a colonel, and he had always been near a uh, army uh, airfield, and all of a sudden now he's in an office building in Kansas City. He didn't like that. He wanted to have a, a weather station in his office, so he asked to have a model station in Kansas City in the Kansas City office building. And, so then, he, and that's where you ended up at. And uh, I ended up, I had a friend who was a real latri, latri, latrine lawyer. <laughs> he knew the score. So he ended up in the office as a typist. Probably he was a clerk typist. He knew how to operate a typewriter. So the colonel asked him, he had just come out of the field, if he knew any people that he could recommend to be a meteorologist and a um, weather observer. And as luck would have it, he liked me. So he put my name in. So I was now with a couple of uh, buddies, uh, gonna be the weatherman, in the middle of this office. So we would, we would have reports from every sending station in the world. People that were flying over to Germany, bombing and sending out reports back to their, to their flight, uh, whoever 
was in charge. And we had to have to plot. In the middle of Pacific Ocean, we were giving temperature reports. In the middle of uh, any place that had a what uh, an airfield had a report of uh, the weather. And we were plotting, we were plotting, and then the, the meteorologist would then put the isobars and the isotherms and then to determine how the weather condition would be. And when he got finished, it was time for him to start another one. So he filed, filed it away. No one ever looked at it. But Eisenhower said, when they, on uh, June 6th, our meteorologists were better than the Germans. And that's one of the reasons we won the war. Yeah, I mean, were you aware of anything with D-Day before it happened, or that there was some sort of, I mean, with, with weather conditions, were you? I woke up in, the, in Kansas City and the next day after D-Day and saw a newspaper. We didn't have a radio. Lived in a hotel, cheap hotel, dollar a day at the Southland, Southland Hotel. And they were paying us to live in Kansas City. So no, no other soldiers. And I woke up and uh, there was a newspaper down the lobby and I had to see whether Pearl Harbor. Uh, I had two buddies living in, in the hotel. I remember knocking on the door to tell them that it had happened the day before. But we, we didn't know. Yeah. So were you in Kansas City for, for most of your, as a weatherman? No, I, 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 in the field for about a year um, all around. A very interesting field one that had uh, pursuit ships. I forget what number they were, but they were all engine, really ugly looking thing. And this was a, an experiment. It was all camouflaged. The control tower looked like a big silo. People, pilots would be flying over, looking for the airfield. They couldn't find it. They would see a farm with uh, cows, you know, and grazing in the middle where they couldn't get near the runway. And that was one of the field. Thund thunderbolts. So I was there for a few months. Moved to Fort Riley, Kansas, where the generals used to fly in, into a field called Marshall Field, mm -hmm. just like this, the store. I was there for a while, and a so couple of... When you were on, you, so after you left out of Illinois, uh, you, were, you were being moved around yeah, to different yeah. airfields? Yeah, T Topeka, Kansas, um, another, can't remember, Mitchell, Fall, Mitchell, South Dakota, all different fields. Was it your whole group? Your, all you guys stayed toge together, no, no, or did no. you get reassigned? Always on detached service. In fact, when I was at Mitchell, South Dakota, they were getting ready to send a, a group of pilots, to B-24s, to Europe. They ended up bombing Germany. A lot of them didn't come back. Oh. And I had a group at Mitchell, South Dakota, run by a... Uh, Captain Fleming, Jimmy Stewart, who was a captain at uh, Topeka, either, Sus either Topeka or Sioux City, I can't remember. They, they, he had a, gr uh, a, a squadron, and there was two other squadrons, and they were all supposed to fly from the Midwest all the way down to South America, and then fly across together in squadron. Well, I'm in Mitchell, South Dakota with Fleming's outfit. By this time, the other three squadrons had flown down there and they're waiting for them to come. They were wait, waiting for the group from Mitchell, South Dakota to get there. And I'm in charge of the weather, the, the daytime. And I have to, to, to pick how, oh, it was easy to determine the temperature and the barometer, but I had no way to measure the clouds. You could measure the clouds at night with shining up a light and catching the angle.
but I had no way to do that. So I am estimating the cloud height. And there's a question of IFR and CFR. CFR is contact, flight rolls, and IFR uh, instruments. And there has to be a certain height. If it's not, it's an instrument, they can't fly. And I'm judging the clouds to be 500 feet. I've been a weatherman probably for three months. So you just eyeball on it? Yeah. <laughs> so this goes on for two days. The other squadrons are in South America waiting for our squadron to get there. And that's not really our squadron because I, st I stayed there after the squadron left. So finally, the, the colonel in charge, captain in charge, would you mind, soldier, if I take off and I go use my altimeter to find out how high the clouds are really, and then I'll let you know if it's high enough for you to send the pilot stuff. I said, sure. <laughs> yes, sir. What's, so, what is that tool that you mentioned that he use, was using? Uh, altimeter. I, and what, what is that? He knows how high he is. And he, once he's surrounded by the clouds, he knows how the high the clouds are. So he gets up, he's up a, a thousand feet already, and, he, and the clouds are still above him. He said, I've checked the height of the clouds. We're no longer on IFR, we're on contact flights. Send them up. And that was the last I saw of the squadron. They took off and they went down to Bali. There's a point where South America and uh, Africa are real close together. Mm -hmm. And that's the point that they were going to fly the, the whole group over. And once they got there, fly north to uh, uh, London or England. Right. When, when they saw. So this was probably, trying to think of when this, when this could have been. This was probably September of uh, 43. Okay. And they got it over in, in time. Because I had been in the field then. I didn't get down to Kansas City until April of 44. So you're, when you're in the field, what do you, what, what well, you, where well, are you? What is your working environment like? Where where are you at? We're right at, at at an airport. Yeah. Uh -huh. And were you like working up in the tower, like what we think of as like a tower? Like no, like, that that would be the tower tower people. Where are you, like in a hangar or something? No. Uh, uh, have you ever been to Lincoln? Yeah. Yeah, a place like that. Okay. Yeah. No dining room, but right. <laughs> No Sky Gallery. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I had been a weatherman. This is September. I had been a weatherman for about three months. And the life and death of these guys were waiting for me to tell them that it was high enough to... But, you know, you, they, what, what's that? Pro protect your... Uh, I forget what. There were initials. But I had nothing to gain by saying that the clouds were high, high enough, so they, they were too low to uh, take off. That was a responsibility that I had. So the people like me spread out in the whole army. It's really surprising we won the war. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so did you work at the, the basically you had a lot of aircraft flying off out off the fields. Like that when that then when the squadron was leaving. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they were practicing, but once they left, there's nothing to do. So then so, I, got, I got shipped out. So how uh, when did you? How long were you in Kansas City? Well, at that, at that when they had, you see this was twenty third. Yeah. The third weather. Once it became 23rd weather, I was in Kansas City. Okay. And that's when, when was that? When did you arrive in Kansas City? April of 40, 43. April of 44. Okay. Yeah. When in 43. April of 44. And how long were you in Kansas City? Well, my mother-in-law, I had asked permission to marry the daughter. When I got to Kansas City, I figured I could be there for maybe 
three or four months. Yeah, well, let's just talk about that a little bit. So you met your wife uh, when and, you were in college. Yeah, right. And then you kept in touch? Yeah, she took my pin. We were pinned for my fraternity pin. That was 42. And she went to a different college than you? No. She went to the same college? Oh, uh, for Illinois. Yeah. Now, I was pulled out of school in 43. 40, in the late 43, I'm keeping the squadron on the ground <laughs> as a weatherman. Mm -hmm. In 44, I'm now transferred to Kansas City, at which time I think I'm going to be there for a while. I was there until from 40, April of 44 until they dropped the bomb in August of 45. So uh, that's when you decide that you should get married? Yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, your wife, she's from Cincinnati. How mm -hmm. did, how, where and when, how did you get married or how did, did you get a leave of absence or how, I knew, how did you I tried you to get a furlough, and... but they couldn't give me a furlough. It wouldn't guarantee a furlough. So I figured if we could get married during a holiday, I'd be able to trade a couple of shifts. And that's what happened. So uh, <coughs> July 4th, 1944, 70 years ago, was the day that we were going to get married. Right. So your anniversary's coming up. 70 years, yeah. Right. Hmm? So did you, did, where did you get married? Did... Uh, we got married in a hotel where uh, it, was a, it was a place like uh, the Regency. Had a dining room downstairs. But did you get married in Cincinnati? Or did you get married? No, uh, in Kansas City. She came to you? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, and we figured it would, it would be uh, more flexible that way. We were going to get married in January of that year, but I couldn't get any time off. Did she stay in Kansas City after you guys got mm -hmm. married? Yeah. Did she stay in that hotel with you? Different hotel next door. <laughs> uh, oh, and let me tell you something. Uh, we, being Jewish, we wanted to have a rabbi to marry us. So I called a temple in Kansas City. I said, we belong to a reformed temple in Buffalo, New York. I'm marrying a girl who is more orthodox than I am. But I would like if you could send the rabbi over to the hotel to marry us on the 4th of July. He's all soldier, we'd be very happy to do that. In the meantime, my father-in-law had been, there was a restriction on being able to get good whiskey and good wine, and we were gonna have a big wedding in Cincinnati, but it didn't materialize. So as a result, he was like the host for the weekend when my folks were there, and Jewel, my wife, was there. And everything was fine. We took our, my folk out to dinner. And the day of the wedding, we're sitting in the suite where we're going to have the wedding. He said, you know, Herschel, I've been paying for everything. But it's your job to pay the rabbi. Because always the husband pays the rabbi. I said, I know that. And I said, with that, I pointed to an envelope I had in my pocket. I said, this is what I'm going to give the rabbi. And he said, well, how much you got in there? I said, $25. He said, $25, too much. Give him 15. <laughs> <laughs> so now the wedding is over, and he's leaving. And I said to him, Rabbi, I really appreciate the fact that you took the time away from your family to come here at the hotel. And uh, to marry us. With that, I gave him the envelope. He said, soldier, you are doing so much for the country. This is the least I can do for you. I can't take your money. I felt so cheap now. He, I was going to give him 25, and he, he's giving me back only 15. <laughs> but uh, but it, was, it was a good wedding, good marriage, and three nice kids. And so you were in Kansas City, so you were just sort of based there? At a, at a, at a big building. The funny thing is, we came back to Kansas City years later at a Rotary convention, couldn't find the hotel. It was a Porter building. It was, it was uptown Kansas City, a little bit north of the railroad station. Just, you come out of a park, 
there was this big hotel, big, uh, big building. Where's the Porter building? Nothing. Turned out that the veterans, the VFW, had bought the building, and that was in headquarters for the VFW now. Ah. And that's the building I was stationed in. So in Kansas City, the whole time you were in Kansas City, you were at a hotel yeah. that the government paid for? Well, they, 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 you know, there's basic prices and then a little bit better prices. Yeah. So, so they were paying it, giving it rations and quarters, what? maybe $2 a day for what? meals. Was there was there military housing? Was that an option for you that you chose out of, or there just wasn't? No, an there option? wasn't. Could have stayed at a boarding house. It was up to me to find the place for us to live. So, so was they, there not a base there in Kansas City? Uh, no, no, there were there were in Kansas. I forget, like Fort Leonard Ward. Yeah, yeah, you know, but that. And but also, you at, there wasn't a base, so you no. were. You were working at a building. You were where you were working at. That wasn't a military building. No, it was a civilian building. And in fact, there was a FM station, state uh, studio down there. So why were you guys in based in Kansas City? Because the middle of the country or something? What? Why? Yeah. Why there? Well, he, the colonel picked up a place where he wanted to have his headquarters. But as he, as I said before, he felt lonely not having a weather station or being able to forecast. He had, I think he had been an enlisted man to begin with, and he just missed the fact that uh, there was no uh, weather station, no uh, army uh, pilots. What was he doing there? What was his? He uh, was a boss. I don't, I mean, I don't know. Was there an boss. army base there though? Was no, no, he, his headquarters. He was able to pick. Why, why his, was this? Well, why was his headquarters there? Was he? Because it was him. <laughs> he, he asked him when they broke up the third weather, going from the uh, Gulf all the way up to Canada. Okay. Where would maybe it was his hometown? I don't know, <laughs> but he was in the Porter Building. Okay. It, it, but then after the war, June. I'm not sure of my dates. Yeah. But the war is over. Well, the bomb dropped in August of 45. Yeah. And that's what... Oh, I know what happened. After D-Day, the war was kind of coming to an end. There was a new project after D-Day, sending the people that had been fighting in, in Europe to Miami to get a two-week furlough and then being sent to Asia. Mm -hmm. So that was the, the, they don't, didn't need the facilities in mi the Midwest right. anymore because they didn't need any more planes in Europe. Right. So that's when they decided to close our, our base mm -hmm. because they were paying rent to or, a civilian. Or whatever it yeah. was. And there's so many empty <laughs> uh, army camps they were going to send us to Colorado Springs, mm -hmm. where they were going to build the, the Air, Air Force Academy. I couldn't afford to leave Kansas City because I wasn't getting paid for rations and quarters anymore. Mm -hmm. I figured I would volunteer for overseas duty. I, th I didn't want to go to, to Asia. Well, did you think possibly you were maybe one of those lucky guys who might be part of the invasion of Japan? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. did you think that was, yeah, that so, was that so, 45, that was sort of yeah. like what everybody was yeah. thinking. That didn't, didn't influence, didn't interest me. So I figured Alaska would be nice. So I volunteered for Alaska. And I said, I'm leaving 23rd weather and I'm going to go someplace else. So I didn't get sent to less Alaska, but I'm sent down to 9th weather based in West Palm Beach, Florida. So I got there. So I, I'm... Was, was that where the weather's sunny every day? You just the forecast is yeah, the same? Yeah, something like that. I didn't have to forecast. It just temperature and the clouds were non-existent. <laughs> so now, instead of uh, being in, sent to Alaska, would you like some of your beer? I, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, 
instead of being stationed in Alaska, I'm stationed in the Caribbean. And I'm in a, a barracks in, no, I can't remember where I am, but they said you, the colonel of Ninth Weather is going to interview you, and you, they're just going to ask you where you'd like to be stationed. Don't be a wise guy and say you'd like to be stationed in Miami or Palm Beach, but come up with uh, 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 some place. And don't say you want to be stationed in uh, I forget the name of the town now. The uh, French Guiana, because that's a, that was an old prison camp, French prison camp. You don't want to be stationed there. But come up with a, a station like Puerto Rico and stuff like that. So now I'm at the interview. He said, soldier, where would you like to be stationed? And I said, Gee, I'm thinking where I'd like to be stationed. And I said, you know, we never had a honeymoon. It would be great if I was stationed in I, Miami. I finally, I finally got it out. He said, so, soldier, we don't usually send people that are coming into the field to Miami. He said, send them out down the Caribbean. But he writes something down. I said to myself, French Guiana, here I come. The next morning. They wake me up and say, you're getting shipped out. Where am I going? You're going to Miami. You're the only one that volunteered for Miami. The guy that was in Miami came down with malaria <laughs> that he had caught in French Guiana. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Just luck. So now I'm in Miami. So you were in Miami starting when? This is after... Um, uh, the first day I was in a barracks before I called my wife to tell her where I was. And it was the uh, Churchill Down, the big race. Yeah, oh, okay, uh, Kentucky Derby. The Kentucky May, Derby. First, first yeah. Saturday of May. Yeah, that was, that's when I got to Miami. Ah, so in 45, that's uh, that's time. right. So is that where you were when you heard about the atomic bomb being dropped? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you, yeah, that was a couple of months later. Do you remember? Uh, where you were when you heard that news? Oh, I do. Yeah. I ran into somebody that I knew from Buffalo. Now, he was from Niagara Falls, and he had gone to Illinois with me. I knew his wife, and he, he is now, he, he had been in the V7 program. He was a naval officer. I'm sorry. No, no, no. No, no. He was a naval officer, and he runs into me and says, Herschel, we're having a movie at the officers uh, club. Why don't you come to the movie with us? I said, gee, I would feel very uncomfortable. I'm only a sergeant and he's a, I think by this time, a lieutenant commander. Don't worry, you come in and you would sit with us and the movie will start, be real quiet, everything will be all right. Anchors Away is a movie from Frank Sinatra they're playing the movie. All of a sudden, the movie stops, and some admiral gets up, and he says, "We have just heard from the Japanese, and they 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 are willing to uh, uh, surrender because of the bomb." Everybody's kissing. Everybody's jumping around, <laughs> and I'm sitting like this. <laughs> so when you tell me, do I remember when I heard about the bomb dropping? I do. <laughs> <Was that? laughs> yeah. I haven't heard that story. That's a good one. Uh, it was very, I felt very uncomfortable. So how long were you in Miami? Well, right after the bomb dropped, uh, they didn't need us to send people over to uh, Asia. Right. So as a result, they weren't bringing anybody back from Europe. So now this is October. They dropped the bomb in August, October. I'm being sent overseas. On the plane that my buddy Gilbert Bossy the third, and I were both weather observers, were getting sent to St. Croix. On the plane, we have to stop in Puerto Rico. On the plane, there's a couple of dozen uh, Puerto Rican girls who are wax. Whack? You yeah, know. sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
and they were getting out of the service on points. They're coming home, and we're going overseas to uh, Saint Croix by way of uh, by way of um, Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. So we were at uh, a, 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 uh, an Air Corps base. It was called Brinkman Field. It later became Ramey. It was on the far side, on the west side of Puerto Rico. So we were there for a while, trying to get transfers, transportation, a flight to uh, St. Croix. We were there a couple of days, and there was no flights. So they finally decided to put us on a plane to San Juan, where we'll catch a boat to St. Croix. And that's what happened. But when we get to uh, uh, an army base, I can't remember the name, in Puerto Rico, they try to give us a detail, because we're now we're sergeants, and the uh, soldiers, Puerto Rican soldiers, are trying to put us on detail, and we keep on telling them. Hap Arnold, who was in charge of the Army Air Corps, said that weather observers who are on detached service don't have to pull detail, <laughs> and they say, no, you have to pull detail, but we don't have. So the, our detail was to pull. Take the ants out of the out of the sugar, so <laughs> <laughs> that was that job. That could be a big job down in yeah. Puerto Rico. Right? Oh, that's right. Okay. And I, I said to the cooks, "We don't have to do this. We don't." I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll cook, and you you peel potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> but they wouldn't wouldn't do it. So a couple of days later, we're on a boat to uh, Saint Croix. On the boat, boss and myself, the only two Caucasians on the boat, are asked to join the captain for, uh, for, for lunch. The captain, and it was a beautiful, it was a little puddle, you know, small little boat, but there was a, probably two or three other officers, and they were really treated like we were on a cruise. And when he got as far as St. Thomas, where we overnight at a uh, naval base, and then the next day we go to St. Croix. Well, St. Croix, I, I think it's that sort of almost like a vacation spot now. You're goddamn right. Uh, what, <laughs> what were you guys going to do down there? Was there a military base in St. Yeah. Croix? Benedict Field. And were they defending yeah. something? The Germans maybe were, was that a soft spot uh, that we had to defend or something? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> because we were defending the uh, uh, Panama Canal. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that was a good spot. Uh, but what? To... Well, you're on a boat. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and, and we're you... first on St. Thomas, and then they move us to, to St. Croix. And the guy running St. Croix is not a Air, Air Corps man, an infantry man. So he, he wasn't, he, he didn't appreciate the fact we didn't make our beds, because again, we just got off of duty. Yeah. <laughs> it was a real chicken. So what were you doing in St. Croix? Were you still doing weather? Well, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. So we were there for a couple of months. It was Christmas time. My mother took a salami, put it in paraffin, and uh, I had that. We're going to open it when we're getting transferred to South Caicos by way of Puerto Rico. There was a civilian group of people on the base, and they said uh, they, they knew me, and they knew I, I didn't have to work all the time. They said, would you like to be our bartender? We're having a party for about 25 people. I'd be happy to. So. Gilbert Bossy and myself go there. I put Gilbert at the window on the outside. Every time I open a bottle of bourbon, I throw a bottle to him. So, because we knew we were getting transferred to a place that didn't have anything, South Caicos. Finally, he called me up. He said, I can't lift this barracks bag. We got too much in it. So I said to him, said to the lady, I have to go back on duty now. 
So I'm, I'm happy to help you, but I have to go to war. So she thanked us profusely. We carry the barracks bag back to the barracks, and we know that we're going to get transferred the next day or so. We a plane comes by going to Puerto Rico, and now this is New Year's Eve. So now we have this big bag of whiskey and the salami, and there's a sign that says baggage checked here. So we don't want, we don't want to take it into the barracks. They had a big army camp, we get in trouble. So let's check the bag here. They give us a ticket, and we go to where the weather people are in the Franklin Field. We're, as we walk in, and they're all drunk. They're having a big party. So says, do you, do you want a drink? And I said, yeah, yeah. So we have a couple of drinks, and they run out of whiskey. I said, do you know where we can get a bottle? I said, hell, we checked our bags down at the airfield. Can you give us a ride in your Jeep? So oh, they'd be happy to. So we go back to the airfield. I've got the baggage check. Give it to them. They can't find the bag. They can't find the bag. What kind of an airfield are you where someone can misplace a baggage? Go all the way up to the commanding officer. We're complaining how people can rob, steal, and uh, how can they take a bag from a group of soldiers that are coming back from St. Croix. <laughs> never, never saw it. So we decided to go back there for a while, go into town, Aguadilla, Puerto Rico, and uh, we are drunk because we're going to the South Caicos, which is probably the hellhole of our weather region. Finally, they throw us out of the dance hall. We're just too drunk. <laughs> and we're sitting on the box, the, on, on, the, on the bus, waiting to take off to go back to the base and feeling no pain. And we're making a lot of noise. An MP comes up and says, soldier, you're making too much noise. Quiet. I said, soldier, go fuck yourself. <laughs> The boss says, what did you say? I said, I don't know what I said. I was just mad. And anyhow, he's now <laughs> coming around the bus, going to the back of the bus. The bus driver must have known what was going on because just as he gets to the door, the bus driver closes the door and takes off. I can't believe you know, that we're not in trouble, but we're so drunk, we're laughing. <laughs> and so laugh. I, honey, somehow, I got a hold of my eyeglasses, they go and fly out. But now I'm blind. <laughs> I write <laughs> right to my wife, so could you have your father send me a pair of eyeglasses? <laughs> it, take, it takes about a week to get them, but I finally got them. So you walked around blind for like yeah, a week? Yeah, blind. So I, I paid a punch, I was punished. God punished me for swearing at a uh, at an MP. So you were in St. Croix till when? Just until New Year's Eve. Oh, okay. That okay. Was your, okay, that was yeah, and uh, had been there since October. No, we were in uh, Puerto Rico, probably until the end of October. So I was in St. Croix for maybe two months, three months, but ten months slowly. And what did you do after St. Croix? Then we went to South Caicos. We're going to have this whiskey. I'm in South Caicos about a month. All of a sudden. And, and where is South, South Caicos? Where, where's, that's an island, right? Yeah, if you, it's check four from Palm Beach to Puerto Rico. If you drew a line, okay. that would be, I think, the closest one. Okay. Anyhow, um, we are there about probably till the middle of January. A pilot comes in, says, "Boy, got great news for you. I saw your, we saw your transfer. You guys are going to get out. You're going back to Palm Beach, 
and then they're going to send you to a separation center. He said, I'll be back in a couple, in the next week. I'll have your orders. So the week goes by, and maybe a week and a half goes by. Finally, we hear from uh, the control tower that this one pilot is coming in. And he said that to get ready to go back with him because he's got our orders. So we take all the weather equipment, put it in a tent, and we're sitting at the runway waiting for him. The bossy, myself, and the third guy. When he lands, he says, he sees us. He says, he says I looked all over for your, your, your uh, papers, your separation papers. I couldn't find them. No one seemed to know anything about them. What should we do? The pilot, who <laughs> had nothing to do with it, he said, you know, I, I don't know. As long as I, he said, as long as I said, I saw them, they were probably there in West Palm Beach. I think if I was you, I'd get on the plane and go. <laughs> we said, yeah, that's a good idea. We got on the plane without orders, being shipped from overseas. And uh, we get to Palm Beach, West West. Now I said to the two guys, I said, my wife is down in Miami where I left her. She's got a car down there. If you can hide in the barracks, because we'd all been stationed at that time, I'll be back there at 9 o'clock in the morning, and we'll go see the colonel. So that's what happened. I go back to Miami Beach. I can't find my wife. She's at a movie. It turned out that she had been at the same movie the night before, but they changed movies. So that was the one place we didn't look for. So she finally comes in, and then we uh, spend the night, got up real early, drive the 90 miles, I guess, maybe, I can't remember, maybe 70 miles to Palm Beach. And the guys are waiting for me. And then we go see the colonel. We walk in to where we had been stationed. That's where the weather headquarters were. They were headquarters of Ninth Weather. No one's in there. It's an empty office. There's a guy outside on a truck. He said, hey, buddy, where's the colonel? He said, I'm the colonel. All my men have been discharged. And with that, they see our weather insignia. He said, where are you guys from? We said, well, we're from South Caicos. What are you doing here? We said, we heard we were getting out. <laughs> he said, that was a week ago. Uh, he said, yeah, that's right. We couldn't decide whether you were overseas or not. If you were overseas, you were still overseas. But if you were stationed here in the States, um, you were eligible for a discharge. If you're overseas, you weren't eligible. We used to get our mail, not as an APO number, but in court of the, according to the base weather station in, in Morrison Field. So then that was a question. He said, but now that you're here, I can't send you back overseas. So there's only two things I can do for you. We either discharge you or shoot you. <laughs> so that's what happened. All right. So that's and how so, you got discharged. Yeah. So. Well, well, wait a minute. So now they were going to send us to a place in uh, Oklahoma City, a big air base, doing all the discharge. So we go out to there, to Oklahoma City, in time to find out that the Air Corps is not discharging anymore because most of the people have been discharged. The Army is now discharging where, where you were from. So they wanted to send me back to Buffalo, or to New York, to be discharged there. And I plead with them. So they're going to send me back to Florida where my wife is to be discharged. So it takes a while to get out of this army camp because all these people are coming back from the war, prisoners, and he can get up only on seniority. This was in Oklahoma City? Yeah. That's, so you were stuck in Oklahoma yeah. City? Yeah. Uh -huh. And all these guys are coming in? From yeah. Yeah, prisoners. Yeah. I, I remember one night waking up with a monkey <coughs> was waking me up. 
<laughs> prisoner in front, his pet monkey. Wow, he had a, he had a monkey when yeah. he was a prisoner? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I guess you didn't interact with many of those prisoners. No, 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 no. Yeah. We, we stuck by ourselves. We always realized that we weren't really soldiers. Yeah. But our time was up. So you got discharged in Miami? Uh, no. They sent me to Blanding in Tampa or Jacksonville. Okay. Yeah. Got there. So when you got discharged, what did you know what you wanted to do next? You're out. Of, you're out of the service. I wanted to go see my wife in Miami. Yeah. And I was there until this was. We left Miami April first, so I was must have been discharged at the beginning of March. And did you? Uh, I just kind of want to talk a little bit, and then we're going to finish the interview, but. Um, what did you do after the war? What did you end up, uh, did you know what you wanted to do and, and what did you end up doing? Well, it so happened, we had the apartment in uh, Florida where I'd been stationed. <clears throat> Let me blow my nose. No, oh, I forgot. Uh, oh, would you just hand me that? Go ahead and keep talking now. Uh, yeah. It just so happened, thank you. My wife's brother had met a girl in Miami and they decided to get married. So the whole family is down there for the wedding. And we're sitting around the hotel, you know, waiting for the wedding. And that's when it came up, this Lou Rubenstein said, you're going back to school. Now, who's, who's Lou Rubenstein? Maybe explain who that. You, we talked about him earlier before we started yeah. taping, but you. Yeah, Lou Rubenstein was a distant relative of my wife's. And my father-in-law had gotten into some trouble with the IRS. And Lou Rubenstein, between the IRS and the and Lou was able to solve all the problem. But at the same time, he had built a nice business and he became the cash, he was in charge of the cash register. He took away that duty. He said, you better have your own bookkeeper and you stay away from me. That's a pledge that I made to the IRS. <laughs> so he was kind of running the business. He had gotten an accountant to run, and everybody answered to Lou. Mm -hmm. So when Lou met me, he said, you are going to become an optometrist. Your father-in-law needs you because his, his son does, it probably couldn't do the job. So that's what happened. So that's but, how you became an optometrist. Yeah, uh -huh. But I did go to work for him. Then my father-in-law died. And then they didn't, I couldn't get along with my brother-in-law. The way he didn't take the job too seriously. He's a good father, but he spent all his time at home ra raising his family. So, so we split the business up after that. So um, you ran that business till, till when? How long? Uh, it's but, still around. Your, your son's running it now, but, but no, how but, long? But what happened was right in 59, so that's not too many years from 46. Uh, we split the business up. My father-in-law died, and we cut the business in half. And that became my, my business, York Optical. Mm -hmm. But how long did you uh, continue doing that until you retired? Well, we, things changed. Lens crafters came, came into town. We were always the people with the dark hats, the black hats. No one liked us. And then try to be a professional, try to run a, a clean business. And I, I feel as if we did, uh, but uh, there was no room, you, either you're real clean or real dirty. There no, <laughs> so our business, and with the cost of labor kind of went up too, our business changed. Yeah. And. Uh, but it, it lasted 20 years after that. 
Well, um, I, I just got one final question uh, since we're running getting close to out of time here. Um, did you apply any of your military training to your your profession as an optometrist, or did, was it? Did you find anything of any use from your time in the military to your uh, profession after uh, your service? Well, I learned again what's important. And when I was going to school, I told you I had a hell of a time staying in college. When I graduated from optometry school, graduated cum laude, the honor society. So I think I learned a lot about life at, in the Army, even though I won't admit it. But there was a hell of a difference between going to school after the war, after being a soldier, and uh, before. Well, great. Well, I want to thank you. Unless you have any final thoughts you want to say, you got no. anything? Uh... No, I just, uh, here's a picture of me as a soldier. I've got my uniform in the closet upstairs. I still got it. But I, I can show you my, my shirt. I can show you where the uh, weather observers Thing yeah, is, we'll yeah. have to take a look at that. All right. Well, anyways, I just want to thank you very much for uh, for uh, letting us interview you about your uh, time in the service. No, so I, thank you very much. But really, you, you thank the people that are buried in Normandy because I I can't say I wish it was me, and I'm sure that they're saying they wish they were me too. Uh, but it, it was a good war. There'll never be another war like that. We're lucky to win it. The people behind us, the women that we kept at home, helped win it. The, the, the reason that they had enough people to give two or three people the same job so that there's plenty of people to do our job. But it's horrible. You just think of Normandy. I was out there long after the battle was over. But it, it's just a bad thing. Yeah. And it will never have a war like that again. But piddly will always be at war with crazy people because they're jealous of us. Yeah. But we have to get out of the, the idea that we want to make every country a democracy. Yeah. Some people are not ready for democracy. <laughs> well, again, thank you so much yeah. for, for telling yeah. us your, your, yeah. your thoughts and everything. Yeah. All right, thank you. Well, thank you. It was nice really meeting you now. I really appreciate the fact that you're taking enough interest in guys like myself. You're getting pretty shaky. But we have a mess of them here. But we don't have as many as we had last year. We've lost a lot of good pilots. Mm -hmm. But we do have a couple of 24 pilots here. Oh, cool. All right, well, we've got to get to those guys. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Well, thank you.